Here we are with part two about getting involved in your local governance in New Zealand. And Andrew, it's wonderful to have you from the Hamilton City Council, from right inside local governance, telling us about what you've learned from your time in there. Tell us how you would advise somebody who wants to get involved in the, the elections in two years' time, how you would advise them to get started now. Right. Well, first, you've got to understand why you want to stand for council. <clears throat> um, and uh, councils have actually been at the forefront of applying um, WEF policy, whether they know it or not. Um, generally, I don't actually think they are aware of it. They're just following um, other guidance. But um, one of the huge Can issues... I I just told you the WEF, for people who are not aware, is the World Economic Forum run by a man called Klaus Schwab. And it's really important that every Kiwi now understands WEF policy, World Economic Forum policy, is running throughout New Zealand in central and local government without, without any discussion with the people of New Zealand. This has been done behind the scenes. I spoke to someone, Andrew, the other day who said they'd never heard of the World Economic Forum. They'd never heard of Agenda 2021 or Agenda 2030, which is what we're, we're battling with now. People need to become educated on those three things, don't they? Yes. So uh, housing affordability, which is one of the big issues facing New Zealand, is straight out of WEF. It was um, it is a direct result of Agenda 21, which had um, a very big push for what was called compact cities. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, compact cities was sold as a way of um, reducing car use, but in effect, it is um, restricting land supply for houses. So um, we know that the price of houses is set by supply and demand. Um, the demand um, is your population, basically. Um, and um, you know we've got immigration and other factors and birth rates and stuff like that governing that. But control of land, um, New Zealand doesn't have a land shortage. <laughs> we've got a big um, group of islands and um, a population of just 5 million. And land area, uh, we're about the size of... Um, Great Britain, which has a population of 60 million. Um, so we've got no shortage of land, uh, but artificially constricting the supply of land drove prices up. Um, and if you look at house prices over the last 20 years, um, the, the building has pretty much tracked inflation. But the base land price is what's quadrupled or more in many areas. And 20 years ago in Hamilton, um, your entry level section would have been under $100,000. It's now um, half the land area and six times the price. And that is primarily because of um, constraints that the council sets on what land is available for development. And, um, and uh, this doesn't just affect homeowners, it also affects renters. Um, and if you can't afford to buy a home and you end up renting your entire life, well, that is directly the, uh, uh, you will own nothing and be happy line from the WEF. And so, it is very important that um, the council is also trying to restrict car usage. Um, and ultimately, of course, the goal is uh, that you don't own a car. Um, you're reliant on um, shared transport systems where you can be switched off um, electronically. Um, and again, it's um, own nothing and be happy. Um, so there's a lot more stuff going on, but those are two highly visible things um, that are having a big impact on us. And um, 
you know, New Zealanders do need to be aware of where it's coming from. And uh, there are a lot of countries around the world um, well, that are having um, essentially the same issues at the same time, which is a bit of a giveaway that there is something globally driving this. Um, because uh, um, Canada, for instance, is having exactly the same housing affordability crisis for exactly the same reasons at exactly the same time. Um, so. It's horrific to think it's all being manipulated from a few people. This Klaus Schwab, who sounds like a monster out of a Bond movie, going, you will own nothing and you will be happy. People will not be happy when they own nothing. They will not be happy when it goes the way that the World Economic Forum wants, which is the few with everything and the many of us with nothing. It is completely wrong, but it hasn't been discussed. Andrew, do you understand how they have got hold, the World Economic Forum, of so many people in national and local government? It, um, it actually starts with indoctrination at universities um, because it was happening at the time when I was at university in the 1990s. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a glimpse as to what was going on because one of my lecturers actually went to the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, which was run by the UN, um, from which Agenda 21 came out of. Um, and uh, he was um, an architect. He was straight up honest about um, he was going along um, as a junket <laughs> Uh, because he worked for a university, he could get government funding um, to go along, and he tacked on a couple of weeks extra for a holiday around South America. Um, and he pointed out that um, the true greenies didn't bother going because if you're flying in from Europe or um, New Zealand, uh, there's a lot of energy use and emissions in that flight. Um, so there are a whole bunch of other activists um, and pretty much everyone was on some sort of um, government funding, not paying their own way. Um, and uh, he, he pointed out that there was a group of German feminists there because um, he wondered, you know, why would the German feminists be coming to a, an ecological um, global meeting, and uh, you know, it was because um, they could get the funding for a trip and a holiday. And in Agenda 21, if you actually read it, most chapters start with statements like, uh, we must save the world and woman. And that's because of the consensus requirement of pleasing this group of German feminists. Um, now, I'm pretty sure... Uh, men would say, well, we actually want to be saved too. <laughs> and if you're saving the world, you're saving women anyway. Um, but then you go on to the next chapter and we must protect um, endangered wildlife and women. <laughs> <laughs> this is throughout the entire agenda. Um, so that uh, I was um, lucky enough to see what was going on in my early 20s. Um, and and then to see other students being indoctrinated. So um, the School of Architecture, where I was at, my background is as an architect, and uh, was uh, shared the buildings with the School of Planning, um, which provides all the council planners that do resource consents. Um, and I could see them being indoctrinated by their lecturers. And then as I've gone through my career, uh, Planners my age have um, worked their way up to the top in, in councils where they are setting the policies and applying what they were taught back then. Um, and they, of course, employ people who think the way they do. So uh, we've got this um, infestation <laughs> um, throughout 
council planning departments. And the, the Resource Management Act actually worked very well for the first 10, 15 years. Um, but it's become a gravy train um, that is extremely expensive, problematic, slow, um, and just um, no longer fit for purpose. And that is purely because of the planners um, and um, then controlling the system. Um, they've made it unworkable. Um, um, and unfortunately, I have to deal with that on nearly every architecture project. And um, 20 years ago, it was easy and I would do my own resource consents um, in three or four pages. Uh, it now is more likely to be three or four hundred pages. It takes uh, six months or more when it's only supposed to take one month. And is hugely expensive, and all of that actually adds cost to affordable housing. Goodness, and this is why farmers also say it's so impossible with all the regulations. Yes. And and on the note of expense of housing, I would have said there the World Economic Forum also has big plans on mass migration without any discussion with the local populations in Canada or in New yes. Zealand or Australia. And this mass migration adds to the fact that land use is being restricted for housing, adds to the enormous increase in the cost of land and houses, doesn't it, Andrew? That's right. Yeah. So, so, so they're, yeah. Out, they're out to sabotage. Mm. The World Economic Forum seems to be out to sabotage the very societies in which they have gained such undue influence. Would that be a fair comment? Yes. Uh, so as I understand it, um, they see democracy as a problem. And uh, I think Winston Churchill will said something like, um, democracy is a, um, is a terrible system, but um, it's the least terrible of all the systems we've tried. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can think that um, well, pretty much everyone would think, oh, if I was in charge, I could do a better job. Um, and I'm sure Klaus Schwab thinks the same, that if he had total control, um, he would be able to do a better job. Um, but better job for who? Because I don't want to live that way. Um, so... Uh, and I'm sure that if I was in charge of everything, um, I'd make it a wonderful place for people who think like me, and there'll be a lot of people who would absolutely hate that. <laughs> so, yeah. Logan, uh, what does that raise for you, Logan Courtney? Yeah, so, I mean, that wasn't the only program that they uh, they installed into schools. They also did the Future Leaders program as well, which is what Jacinta Ardern uh, participated in. <clears throat> so there, there was that as well. Uh, and the other thing is too, yeah, they they with the planning consents and all that sort of thing, they also ask for a lot of ecological things as well, which is again tying up a lot of a lot of the process and also funds as well. And sometimes it means that if you've started to develop a piece of land, and I have some friends that have tried to do that, and they literally cannot move forward because what they class as wetlands, which they drained, has now become an ecological restoration location and so they say that's it you can't build on it even though these people got got approval beforehand but then something happened at council and so yeah they just go and change the rules as they see fit and so sometimes you do sit there and go would it be easier or cheaper just to go through the coa um process which is basically do the job first and then ask for uh forgiveness later on <laughs> Again, we shouldn't be doing we shouldn't be doing or promoting that sort of behaviour. But some some people do do actually work that way. Uh, another thing you see people doing too is they'll just go get cladding instead of getting a permit to go get their cladding. They'll just get cladding and stick it straight over the top. They're still getting a, a rotting house. They're still getting a house that's leaky and all that sort of thing. But they just they need to change the cladding. They don't want to go through the permit process. They don't want to spend thirty-four thousand dollars on, you know, forty thousand dollars getting the same cladding that they've got, like for like, and they just go straight over the top. So it's one of these things where 
yeah, we we have to we have to start actually pulling these departments to to pieces so that so that we can actually move forward with this. Um, not only that, there's there's another very important thing. When we look at entities like Antifa or we look at um, Black Lives Matter, when they go through and they do their protests and it turns into riots and they smash up these once thriving business areas, what ends up happening is the the price of property absolutely plummets, which of course companies like BlackRock and you know all, all the other usual players come and pick it up you know on the dollar. Uh, 10 cents on the dollar and then the rest of us are all sitting there we don't have access to the capital we don't have access to the the you know the finances or the all the time to be able to see these deals we're too busy sweeping the streets to clean up all the broken glass and then what happens is they come in oh well we've already you know we've already got people within in council and so therefore we can get the consents and so when you look at places like you know, Queenstown, where they're absolutely building like there's no tomorrow, and even places in Christchurch, where again, huge swaths of used to be farmland are now turning into, you know, either mines, which is releasing silica dioxide into into the air. Um, and, and some of these permits have been allowed to, you know, encroach 100 metres from the actual pit. Again, that's going to become an issue later. But the other thing is these people that are already on that treadmill of absolutely making massive, massive um, areas, instead of council building those and then the savings or the, you know, the costs get passed on to the, the rate payer, what ends up happening is they make all the profit and then we t- pick up all the cost. So, again, this, this affects us more than just one way. It's not just you know, planning needs to be destroyed. It really is the whole system needs to be overhauled, just like Andrew just said. Andrew, that that sounds so devastating. What yeah. what do we do about that? Well, uh, we've got to get good people onto council, and then we can start to make a change. Um, so, I would encourage uh, New Zealand loyal members to stand if they can. And um, it's not for everyone, so I'm going to give you a bit of a warts and all um, insight into what it's actually like and, and what the role really means um, so that you can make your own informed decision. Um, but I think it's a good preparation for central government politics as well. And if you stand... Um, in the next council elections, which are in two years' time. Um, It's a good way of raising your profile for uh, central government elections, even if you don't get in on the council. Um, So worth having a serious look at it. Um, So now that we know why we're standing to try and um, stop the the rot that is going on, um, I'll start telling you about the role of being a councillor um, and the good things and the bad. So firstly, um, a good thing compared to um, getting elected as a member of parliament is you get to stay home. You know, you don't have to go to Wellington. Um, the pay isn't great <clears throat> and it varies from council to council um, and it's set through complicated government process. Um, And so I'm earning $80,000 a year as a councillor for Hamilton City Council. Um, The bigger the council, the more you get. So for the very small councils, um, it really is a bit of a pittance. Um, For the big councils like Auckland, um, it's quite a good income. And this is a particularly silly system because the councils all have the same work to do and um, the councillors uh, are reading pretty much the same material dealing with the same sorts of issues across the country and um, so for instance um three waters you know um, debate over that was the same in Auckland as it is in um, Otarahonga which I think has about 10,000 people um population and I suspect that they'll be and um, the councillors there will be paid next to nothing. <clears throat> um, but um, and for me, um, this eighty thousand dollars a year—that's um, a drop in my income from being an architect of about a hundred thousand dollars. So it's costing me a lot of money to be on council. 
um, but uh, I want to make the change. Um, for me, it is a part-time job. Um, the hours vary from week to week, depending on the number of meetings and things and the amount of reading to be done in a week. So I typically allow um, two to three days per week, um, or it might be um, three or four half days, um, depending on what's going on. So um, it's it, if you're... Um, and um, if you're able to stop working, the semi-retired stuff like that, um, it's a comfortable way of um, being involved. Um, you still have plenty of time for other things. It's a bit hard if you're trying to keep another job going, which I'm doing at the moment <laughs> with, with my architecture business, but I'm winding that down. So... Um, um, the the there are meetings, lots of meetings, and um, and typically you have to do a bit of reading for the meetings. The staff write reports, um, which means the staff control the narrative because they choose what goes into the report, and um, and this is something you always have to remind yourself, um, is that you know, what did they leave out of the report, and. Um, you know, what experts did they not talk to? Because uh, the staff typically are trying to get a particular result um, and uh, things will be couched in that manner. And so uh, in the meeting, um, you run through these reports, um, you get to ask questions um, of the staff and then you move into a debate with other councillors. Um, it's quite a structured um, system run according to a set of rules called standing orders. Um, so it's quite easy and stress-free. Um, in Hamilton, we typically have two minutes for each person to debate. <laughs> so this is um, another issue, the, the lack of real depth um, in, in, in any analysis. Um, so in preparation for meetings, I often um, I get the agenda a few days beforehand and I have a network of experts that I ask for advice. So I know what questions to ask the staff and to dig into um, and present my case. Um, the debate is... Um, supposed to be about trying to convince your other councillors um, to side with you on your way of thinking. Um, but mostly it seems to be um, to try and make a sound bite that might get into the newspaper the following day. Oh. <laughs> so it, it can be unbelievably shallow at times. Um, and then you have a vote. Um, and uh, compared to my business, um, Ending a meeting without having more work to do um, is just unheard of in architecture. But in council, once you've had the vote, it doesn't matter whether you've won or lost. Um, uh, you can walk out of the council chamber without anything more to do. Um, the staff might have much more to do, and their job is to sort out the result of the vote. But I walk out of the meetings and completely stress-free, completely relaxed, and um, no, take the rest of the day off. Um, it is literally the easiest job I've ever had. Um, good. Yeah. It's like a good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, but it's so appalling because it's mm -hmm. those people behind the scenes who are doing all the running of yeah. the real agenda. Correct. Wow. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, unelected. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, the councillors are there to um, essentially take liability off the staff. Um, wow. Now, um, while it's an, um, it's an easy job and can be quite enjoyable, um, and there is also no accountability for three years, so that's another stress remover. Um, uh, there is 
um, or a lot of good people just get too frustrated. They might do one term and um, not go back uh, because you can feel very ineffective um, um, and get very disillusioned about the system. So um, it isn't for everybody. Um, and it's much, much easier um, or much more worthwhile if you can get a group onto the council um, because like, I've just got one vote, same as every other councillor, and I'm outnumbered on most key issues. Um, if I had enough colleagues um, joining me that we could actually um, win the majority of votes, then I would get the opportunity to be very influential. Um, now, um, I hope that the next election might get that result. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the, this three years as the preparation for next time when we might be able to um, have more control. And if you work towards that, um, then it could be very satisfying. And now, councillors do have some other roles uh, as um, advocates for the public in dealing with issues with council so that um, anyone can ring me um, and I will give them advice on um, how to deal with the council, work through issues, or I contact staff um, and say, hey, you need a second look at this or what can we do here? Um, and uh, sometimes that can be really satisfying. Um, there's, there's some people who've had huge problems that I've been able to resolve. Um, um, my background in having done many resource consents, um, I know more about the planning than the planning staff do. <laughs> so I've been able to uh, correct them. Um, and uh, so that's uh, that, that's something I feel very positive about. Um, what a wonderful gift you must be to the people of Hamilton. Tanya, what's, what's Andrew's reputation in Hamilton among the people, the good people? Yeah, the good people, that's us. Um, great. Look, Andrew, we're so grateful that there is someone that we can um, approach and talk to. Um, I believe there are a couple of others that are starting to change their tune a little bit too. Yes. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to say the name or not, but one of the other councillors is joining the Hamilton Resident Ratepayers Association meeting on Saturday that I'll be attending. So um, we'll see what comes out of that. Um, he's, he's, he's flipped right over by the sounds, but we'll see what happens at the meeting and see what's being said. He actually got in touch with um, Siggy um, and yeah. asked to have a coffee with her. He said, I think we may have a little more in common than what we used to. Yes. Because they used to clash. Is Siggy, Siggy another councillor, Tanya? Was, was. She's a friend of mine. She walked away um, battered <laughs> at the time. Yes. She was a bit before her time. Yeah, I think that, that was That the is problem. shocking, Logan, isn't it, that they walk away exhausted and Really, as leader and deputy leader of Loyal, we could be looking over the next year particularly at getting large groups of people to do what Andrew advised. Logan Courtney, what do you think? Getting groups to stand in each council and stand in the next election in two years, already starting to work together as supporters and collegially so that when they get in, they won't feel battered and outnumbered and defeated by this terrible bureaucracy that seems to go on. What are your views, Logan? Yeah, I, I really think that, um, you know, time, first of all, kind of is on our side and the fact that, uh, you know, every time you get one bad councillor or two bad councillors, I mean, you can remember that you can reverse that. You can get three or four good councillors or councillors that, you know, are there for the people. So, 
it, it's, it's one of these things where if you look at it that, yeah, let's start working together, let's start communicating. I mean, NZ Loyal's entire policy is that this is the people's movement. So it's not about Liz, it's not about Logan, it's not about Tanya, it's about people like Andrew that are willing to stand up together and, and have conversations outside and say, look, wh what do we think about this and having the debate? Because like Andrew said, if you've got two minutes to debate something, I mean, seriously, how are you supposed to have a conversation about that? Normally you haven't finished saying I by then. So, yeah, it's one of these things where don't don't ever feel defeated. Just just think, you know, let's start working together. Let's start having a conversation. Because if you start feeling defeated, it's because you're on your own, which means you need to start having more conversations with more people that you can rally towards uh, taking these councils back because it is your council and I think that's something that we need to remember. Yeah, Andrew, how does that make you feel, the thought next time you stand of being surrounded, if we were lucky enough to have you stand locally for loyal, um, to be surrounded by other loyalists, those who also understand this is the people in New Zealand now taking back the power for the people. Yeah, it's a really positive. Um, there's, there's been times um, in the past where I have felt very much alone um, on all sorts of issues and, and trying to understand what is going on with um, this world. Um, because you expect um, uh, you know, the government to be run by sort of sensible people, not necessarily the, the best and brightest, um, but uh, not people who are sort of act actively trying to sabotage things. That you know, where is the sense in that? Um, but which sort of brings me to the next point, and um, that um, you know, there are a lot of misguided people out there. Um, working for councils, uh, they have been misguided. Um, and the biggest danger of um, getting elected um, without the support, um, and if if you're um, if you end up on council feeling alone on a particular local council, um, I'm sort of trying to establish a bit of a network of uh, councillors from councils across the country um, who are sensible so we can support each other and share the same experiences and what we did in each situation. Um, because the danger is something we call staff capture. Um, and it's um, very real and the staff are very good at it. Um, they've had a long time and a lot of practice uh, to get their systems right. Um, so uh, before each staff, uh, before each council meeting, we have a briefing by staff. Um, and this gives the staff a chance to present a case and sort of direct us towards particular outcomes without being quite so obvious um, before we've had a chance to work out all our questions and everything. Um, and the staff reports in the council meetings are always presented with a staff recommendation and the, the report is written to support that recommendation. So it becomes very easy to simply vote for the staff recommendation. Um, and then um, you, you're um, you're in the bubble echo chamber um, in the council of uh, only talking to council staff, only hearing the one point of view um, and not being out in the community um, getting the different options. And so you start to decide with the staff on things and think, oh, yeah, the staff know what they're doing. The staff are the experts. And I've had uh, councillors in Hamilton say, oh, um, we really should vote for the staff recommendation because they are the experts. They know what they're doing. Yeah. And, yeah, um, that is not the role of councillors. The role of councillors is to be challenging the staff at every opportunity. Um, so we are really failing to get the basics of good governance um, once we have the staff capture. And... Um, gosh, you see councillors falling for that all the time. Um, so 
Uh, it's because yeah. they're not critically thinking. They're not looking outside the box or they're just plain lazy is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, plain lazy is actually a big issue because um, it can be a very cruisy job if you are just reading the staff reports. Um, and the staff give you... Um, it looks like they're giving you all the information you need to make the decision. So um, they'll present you two or three options. Um, and of course, you know, if you're giving someone options, you have one good option and two terrible options. <laughs> so you can guide everyone towards that. Um, um, you know, all, all that manipulation goes on. Um, and yeah, you need to be prepared for that. I don't know That's so with. cynical. What was that, Tanya? So I don't even know where to start with that. They're just how do they, you can't even run a business that way. It's like just so impractical and so illogical. There's no logic behind that. It's like you're listening to people that, are they qualified for the job? It's almost like they're qualified more in a psyops, you know, like in psychology than it is about actual facts. Yeah. Now, um, if you try and think of it from the staff's point of view, um, you know, say you're an, um, you've got um, a belief that, um, yeah, reducing car usage um, is an important environmental goal, um, and you've got a councillor whose background might be um, as a disc jockey, which was one of Hamilton's former councillors, <laughs> um, or a union organiser, um, or, you know, um, I could go through a few others, um, former teacher. Um, uh, what What is their environmental expertise? You know, you're being governed by dummies. Um, and really, you need to, doing a good job is ensuring that these dummies um, vote the right way. Um, so, yeah, uh, you can see how they will go home at night and sleep very well thinking they've done a good job and served their community by um, directing the people. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's areas of council work which I know nothing about. Um, you know, I'm not a surge engineer. Um, so, <laughs> I can't give good governance on the surge. Um, um, but um, you know, that is supposedly what my job is. So it's very easy to say, okay, well, here's a staff report. Um, and I'll just go with that. Um, and uh, when it comes to surge, um, I'm sure they do a far better job than I would do. <laughs> But there are other things where um, the, the social engineering, um, like, uh, and, and the planners might know something about um, urban design, um, but uh, you know, they aren't trained to be analytical about social engineering and whether it really is a good thing or not. Um, they're, they're really but, quite brainwashed by the World Economic yeah. Forum agenda language could you do something like this andrew could you uh go to a sewerage business in town and say look i know nothing about sewerage but i'm expected to vote on this could you give me feedback on what you think uh this council policy is this is what we're being herded into by the advisors to council as somebody working in this area could you tell me what you think that's what I'd love to do because loyal, yes. we've always said from the beginning, we're not ever going to be politicians. We're representatives and representatives must listen to the people. So yes. how could you as a councillor listen to the experts beyond just the advisors, the bureaucrats? Yeah. So that is exactly what I do. Um, and um, I have a network from you know, my business time. Um and uh, also a network of people 
um, interested in politics, uh, for example, the, the Hamilton Residents and Ratepayers Association. Mm -hmm. So um, it might be two degrees of separation to get to a sewerage engineer, um, but I do that. And uh, these people are always happy to give free advice. Um, you know, there's plenty of experts out there who really do care about the city um, and are absolutely thrilled um, to be given the opportunity and actually have someone listen to them on the issues that you know, they have expertise in. And for the people to be asked, you know, yeah. This, yeah. because that's what it is all about, isn't it? The people, you know. Yes. Um, and uh, it's fairly obvious that most of the other councillors don't do that. Logan, isn't it insane that we have reached this point in New Zealand where the last people consulted so often are the very people affected by the law changes or the regulations that these politicians, local and national, are making on behalf of the people. The people are not being listened to in this country. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a multifaceted subject. I mean, first things first, there's a lot, a lot of regular, regulatory things that these these bureaucrats actually have to deal with. Uh, another thing too is timelines. Um, just to give you an example that I got, I got told three days out uh, that we had a contaminated uh, asbestos and other ground contaminations and that this was for an international movie theatre, uh, sorry, a movie lot that uh, we were we were going to open and start running. So again, a lot of this is that it's all very siloed. And so like Andrew and all of the other councillors have to deal with, a lot of these bureaucrats actually, they don't have the grand plan. We don't sit in at these 10-year or 15-year plans. We have KPIs that we have to deal with. We have all of these other things that we've got to do. And listen, WorkSafe will come down and jump down your throat if you get it wrong. Not only that, if you put a crane up in the wrong place and it's a military no-fly zone, not only will they shut down your job site, you have a full investigation of why you've breached military no-fly zones. So there's a lot of things that you've got to do that you've got to be aware of, even as the bureaucrat. Um, and a lot of these people are just trying to do their job. You know, they they and again, I'm not trying to make excuses. You've decided to be a servant, a public servant. And this is something that I used to remind my teams all the time. We used to take them to the windows and say, look out there, look at all those houses, look at all the vehicles. They've got people in them. And that's who you work for. So every decision that you make must be for the benefit of them, not for, you know, people outside of the country or, you know, not what the CFO wants. At the end of the day, it has to be what the people want because they pay the bills. And that's really what it goes down to is accountability, is that everyone's saying, oh, somebody else is, you know, accountable for this, somebody else is accountable for it. Well, no, when no one's accountable for it and all we have to do is have a rates increase, I think this is the problem. And so I think we need to be very Greek in this approach of, hey, wait a minute, you're not doing what I want you to do. And I think that instead of throwing people in jail or confiscating their houses or stealing their houses, we need to actually say, wait a minute, we've got 50% of the population not paying their rates. We're doing something wrong. We need to start listening. And this is what I'm saying. Money, money talks and money walks. And we need to we need to make sure that we have these systems in place, which is part of our strategic plan for uh, NZ Loyal, which is the money has to be controlled or the assets have to be controlled by the people, not and we lend them to the the governance or government, which is what we've got at the moment, so that when they make a decision that's inappropriate or it's wrong or they just want to sell it off to KPMG or any other company like that. And and I know I didn't go to KPMG, they were just a scalp group for every other, you know, BlackRock type company there was. The the, the point that we're trying to make here is is that we need layers of control so that we can very quickly be notified that, hey, you've done something wrong. We need you to have another look at this. Instead of, oh, who's the, you know, who's who's the representative in our, our area? Oh, wait, I can never get them on the phone. I can never go to their pop-up. I can never go to anything they've got. But here they are turning up to military camps and doing parades and all this stuff, which have nothing to do with, you know, what they're doing. So I think that the, the big thing here is, is that we say that there's accountability, but in actual fact, there's not. And that's how they get get away with whatever they're doing. And I think we need to be very, and I'm going to say it again, need to be very Greek. Stop paying your taxes when the entities that are supposed to be protecting you and, and working for you aren't doing the job. 
because just like Andrew, if he if he does something, you know, draws me an architectural picture, and I'm like, that sucks. I'm not paying. Then he has to go to court to go and get that money. It's not preordained that I owe him this money. And the same thing needs to happen here is that if you're going to sit there and say, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna force you. You know, at the at the end of a gun, which is when they send the police or the IRD to come and get you, or they just come and confiscate your house through the courts. If they don't have that power or ability to do that, then what that means is, oh, now you have to listen. So I think, yeah, we really need to we really need to reassess the entire situation. I think There's so much in that answer, and um, really, your background. Just briefly, Logan. Your background in Australia was in this whole sort of bureaucratic nightmare, this bureaucratic jungle, wasn't it? Oh, and in New Zealand as well. So I've I've worked for multiple government agencies and um, and also had to go out in Civvy Street as well. Um, and yeah, it's there are a lot of people. I mean, you have to remember that when you try and hire someone in council, not all of them do this, but some of them do it, where it's. Do I hire the person that's best for the job that might have an attitude or something like that that will actually do a phenomenal job? Or do I hire someone who's going to make me look good? You know, they don't have to be good at their job, but they can make me look good. And so then it starts becoming about, you know, when you turn up to this committee, to give you an example, <laughs> they'll set up a committee, which is purely to make decisions. And then what they'll do is they'll send the, you know, the 2 IC or they'll send someone else that's, you know, senior to, to their position but not doesn't actually have the authority to sign off on things. And then, well, they don't want to go either because I'm too busy. And it's always I'm too busy. And then um, what they do is they end up making these committees that can't make any changes whatsoever. And then what they'll do is they'll go, okay, we need a new committee. And then what happens is anyone from middle management onwards sits there going to committees all day going, why the hell am I going to this committee? I have no authority to make any changes whatsoever. And then if you go, right, I'm going to do something about it, um, yeah, you get written up. Like you get a form, you get a written warning. And I've I've had one because I went to a, a, a training within council. I went to a training because I couldn't get a hold of my managers. I mean, I was quite high up and I got a written warning because it was, yeah, you should have turned up to work. And I said, well, I couldn't get hold of you. And this is actually fundamental to the project that I'm doing. And they said, and, and this blew me away, and I'll, I'll never forget this. It says, if you are not able to get hold of us, it's better that you don't attend the training or that you don't get the um, the goal completed and you turn up to your desk. Now, when you're dealing with that sort of thing, I mean, you sit there and go, yeah, sure. No, no, no. I should put as many um, counters to my report or the the you know thing that affects my KPI and my pay rise and all these other things. Of course, they're going to tell you the easiest, most non me getting hauled up in front of work safe or safe work in Australia. So yeah, this is this is all all forms part of it. That's why people who are very good at what they do <laughs> not last the councils because. I can go earn 200 grand doing something else, or like Andrew, I can earn a lot more money going doing something else. Why would I stay here and get smashed for, you know, even in Auckland, say you're a health and safety advisor, you're earning 90,000. So you may as well just be, you know, on social welfare at that rate. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but in Auckland, it's not. When, you know, like a basic house is $1.1 million. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it's just not, it's just not worth the fight sometimes. And that's, that's what it comes to. Andrew. That's so sad, Tanya, isn't it? It's it's a whole system leading to mediocrity. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, Andrew, a lot of people um, in the Resident Rate Payers Association and a lot of groups are coming to the council when they're, al when they're allowed to or when they're available, but only on the subject that is allowed to be talked about. Do the councils, do the councillors listen at all? Right. Um, so I'll just... Uh... Um, make a comment on what Logan said before I come back to this question. Um, so uh, Logan mentioned committees. Um, in private business, you form a committee out of the experts that you need to get the best decision. Um, and the purpose of the committee is to get the best decision. Um, in the public sector, the purpose of the committee is that no one person can be held accountable for it. But any decision they make is a collective decision um, and uh, a non-decision is a good result. So once you understand that, <laughs> uh, these, these committees, it would be good to get rid of most of them. Um, and... Uh, um, 
I'm not anti-council staff. I often think that they actually need to be empowered to make decisions. Um, and that's one of the core failings where um, they're too scared to make a decision. So back to Tanya's uh, question. Um, so uh, every council meeting is open to the public and um, the public can come along and they can request a speaking slot, um, uh, two minutes or five minutes, depending on situations, um, so that uh, they can speak to a topic that is on the agenda. Um, yes. And this is um, potentially a good way of lobbying council on some issues. Um, when I look around the other councillors in Hamilton, um, when the public members are speaking, three quarters of them will be on their phones, tapping away, um, not listening, um, which is very, very disappointing. Um, when you put in written submissions to council um, on things like annual plans, rates, rises, stuff like that, um, the staff will typically collate all the responses and simply come to council and say, oh, we had 36% um, of people supported this or and 42% didn't really care. Uh, and we don't get the insight into what people actually said. Um, we have to, uh, we do have the ability to go digging for it, but most councillors will skim over that, just take the staff report, um, not go through the submissions um, and we are relying on the staff to um, have um, honestly represented that information um, and I don't necessarily think we can honestly <laughs> no I'm actually starting that. to think that that's what's happening it is not yeah yeah uh so, an honest reflection of what is being thought because hmm. in hamilton uh, people i ask have no idea that hamilton city is a smart city yeah and yet you go and mention it anything about it i did the other day on um online on media um about the um surveillance and that eventually it could lead to fines and tolls if mm. you are moving without within outside of your areas, etc., which is happening overseas and it's been very much proven. Um, and actually, a council worker um, rubbished me, actually trolled me really badly, in fact, and insulting. Um, mm. And everyone after, I didn't actually have to say anything because everyone afterwards did do something about it and said that that was unacceptable. Yeah. Um, I've had someone say to me that I should actually make a complaint because it was a breach of code of conduct within as a council employee. Yes. Um, yeah, so it, it was really shocking that he called me a tin hater, basically, and a conspiracy theorist when it's actually the truth. Yes. A conspiracy theorist is a badge of honour. It simply means um, you'll be proven right in six months' time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, written submissions are very ineffective. Um, it is better to do the the um, turn up and do an oral submission, um, because a quarter of the councillors might listen to you, um, and the cycle lobbyists have been very effective by um, turning up to many meetings. Um, and uh, so they get themselves known. So if you're prepared to put in the time going along to three or four meetings in a row and hammering the same points, it does eventually get noticed. And surprisingly, uh, the councillors seem to listen to that, um, whereas they should actually listen to everyone properly and if if that um if the person there for just one time actually makes a good point that should be enough uh, but oh, it's not yeah i have been told that the um 
a few of the councillors are very on board with the cycle, cycle, cycle or bicycle yeah. cycling lobbyists. Yeah. They have they are given more time in free time to talk than anyone else because right. it's a um um what's the saying conflict of interest really their mates yes. their mates yeah, so they correct. get to speak more which means the rest of us in Hamilton have to poke up with the nonsense of all the roading changes and the it's just diabolical and people are asking me now um I just had a um ex cardiac well retired cardiac surgeon come in um and see me today and he was saying he should you should see my place out Peacock's Lane out Peacock's Road he's obviously yeah. with all the road he said they have made the road is smaller for the traffic than the footpath and the cycle lane Yes. And he said the cycle lane is made out of concrete, which is a harder wearing material and more expensive and more permanent than the tar seal that is used on the road in a very narrow fashion. He said, what part of this does not make sense? <laughs> um, and yeah. I said, well, we're working on it. You know, maybe he needs to get involved as well. Um and maybe he said a lot, he's got a few friends and I think they all sit around and grump and drink coffee together, but I don't know whether they're actually, I might actually have a talk to them and say, how about we, you know, bring it in. Yes, because if there's more people that know uh, that there are people like us who are standing up um, and that they don't feel alone and that collectively we can do something, um, they might be prepared to help because it always comes back to divide and conquer. Um, yeah. And if we are all isolated, um, we all just tend to give up eventually. Mm. Um, yes. So uh, back to actually being a counsellor, and if um, anyone is interested, um, I'll just talk about how to stand. Uh, and um, the first point is, of course, um, counsellors seem to mainly get elected on name recognition. So if, if they've been around a while, um, uh, they, they tend to stay in. So there isn't a high level of turnover of councillors. Mayors, there tends to be more turnover of mayors because um, as the, the face of the council, they cop the flat. Um, and mayors generally aren't smart enough to realise that they are the full guys for the staff. <laughs> because uh, the mayor gets kicked out, um, the chief executive and the uh, management team stay the same. Um, so uh, it certainly helps if you have some sort of public profile. Otherwise, it's, it's just a lot more work um, to get elected. And um, the first time you stand, you may well not get elected, but... It, it gets your name out there. So you might take a longer process. So I wasn't elected the first time I stood, um, only the second time. Um, so uh, there is a limit on how much money you can spend on elections. Um, uh, for a councillor in Hamilton, it's $20,000, um, which um, and there's still a lot of money, but at least it's, it is some levelling of the playing field um, and most candidates tend to go for the um, core board or core suit signs that um, blight the landscape in election times. Um, but if you can get other ways uh, of marketing um, and that it could be through uh, New Zealand loyal networks um, or other sites uh, to promote yourself, um, that is a big help. I had written a lot of articles for um, news sites, um, um, critiquing many council decisions, and I think that got my awareness up. Okay. The, we're going to we're going to have New Zealand loyal media, so we can really support the local candidates and yeah. give good profile like this. Yes. yes. Now, apathy is the killer. Um, so Hamilton's uh, last election, the voter turnout was 30%. Um, wow. 
uh, is as dismal. Across the country, it was, I think, sort of around 40%. Um, so we really do need to encourage a lot more people to vote um, and giving some thought as to why they don't vote and who to target, um, I think would be quite useful in going into an election. Um, now, you've got two years to the council election, so that's a fair bit of time to get started and start raising your profile. Um, in, the, uh, in the elections um, where I got elected, uh, there was uh, media smears of anyone who could be associated with Voices for Freedom. Um, and um, I would assume that there would be similar media attacks on New Zealand Loyal. Um, it's something to be aware of um, that uh, you're going to get a lot of negativity from some groups. Um, I don't think it did me any harm. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it raised my, my profile again. Um, that's that's yeah. wonderful, and and that's the whole MS mainstream media smearing of people as conspiracy theorists, which, yeah. as you said, Andrew, is now a compliment for yeah. someone with critical thinking skills. Yes, and those people that believe the mainstream media, they aren't going to vote for you anyway, so who cares? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so uh, it is it's worth doing. Um, the enrolment fee is something like $100. Um, and if you get um, a minimum number of votes, you actually get that money back. <laughs> so uh, there are quite a few people who use the candidate system um, as marketing for other issues where they've, they've got no particular intention of getting elected, no real hope of, of getting elected, but um, it's a very cheap form of advertising because the council has to pay for putting your own blurb about yourself um, into the pamphlets that go to every single household. Um, uh, so yeah, it is very affordable marketing. <laughs> the the uh... The timeline on this, how soon would you recommend people who want to stand begin to take seriously their campaign? Right. And I'd like, Logan, your views on this as well. Yeah. yeah. So um, raising your profile in terms of, say, writing for media, um, you know, websites, Facebook, whatever, um, the sooner the better. Um, um, you can you can go hard um, eight weeks out, um, uh, but um, it would be better to get involved in groups like um, ratepayers associations um, as well. Um, Senior again, um, and just start to get more involved in things. Come along to council meetings to see what they're really like, um, and. Uh, yeah, um, you don't have to think seriously about it until, say, six months out, but you could spend the next year and a half just finding more about how councils work so that if you get elected, you're ready for it, or you might say, hell no, I don't want anything to do with this. <laughs> um, and then uh, six months out, um, you know, start really um, talking to people and, and getting um, a bit of a team together who can help go put up the signs, hand out pamphlets or, or whatever you think you need to do. Um, the wonderful oh, oh, sorry. Oh, Tanya, yes. Sorry, Liz. We've got a by-election coming up in Fe February. That's right. Because Ryan um, Hamilton has gone to National, which is interesting. Hopefully he'll make some changes in there with Winston. And um, the coalition. <laughs> mm. um, so, how do you think would be the best way to deal with that? To get into, like, to to deal with that because really, it's right over Christmas. Yeah. So, um, I um, I expect Tim McIndoe to stand. 
-hmm. and I expect he would win. Mm -hmm. um, so just because uh, um, he's got the name recognition, and for those who don't know, Tim McIndoe was a national MP for two or three terms, and so he's already got a high profile. Uh, we're having a bit of a shift to the right now, which is good, um, and he's actually a decent person. Um, yes. So um, I, uh, I've, I've spoken to him and encouraged him to stand. Um, I hope he will. Yeah. Other people um, may as well put their name forward. Um, they might not get elected, but at least it will raise a bit of profile for them and um, don't have to try particularly hard. And it's only $100. <laughs> yeah, you treat it as a learning experience. Gosh, that's good. Logan, your your thoughts on on loyalist, loyal supporters getting ready for the local elections in two years. What timeline do you give that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Andrew. I think the sooner the better. Um, especially if you want to, you know, participate in charity groups and you know, like like Andrew said, just just put a network of people around you. Um, probably talk to groups like, you know, NZ Loyal and Everybody else, and just find out exactly, you know, is this for me? Is this what I want to do? But um, yeah, I, I would definitely. I mean, even if you started talking to people, knocking on doors, and saying, "Hey, I'm Bob. Um, I care about this community. Uh, what's your thoughts?" Um, I know that's really intimidating, but people really have to remember that this whole thing is about talking to people. So if you're if you're adverse to doing that, or you you know you're afraid of doing that, then that's something that I would say practice now. Get into it now because if you don't, um, that fear is going to stop you. I mean, we've got a, a motto in my family, which is feel the fear and do it anyway. So it's, yeah, we the country needs you to do this at every level. So the more practice, like Andrew said, that you can get, then, hey, maybe next time you don't want to run for local, you might want to run for central government. So that's, yeah, that's what i got. And, Andrew, I just want to say again this week how inspiring it is to talk to you, to see someone of your calibre who cares so much about his local community, I think it will inspire many other people to do exactly what we're talking about, to stand. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for this week. And let's keep talking about how to, how to get involved and inspiring more and more real Kiwis to take over these local governance spots so that we can get the nonsense that you talked about at the beginning of this tonight, to get all that World Economic Forum nonsense out of our councils. Do you think that is doable to finish up tonight? Do you think it is achievable? Uh, it is very much achievable if we can get majorities on councils. Um, mm. It is a numbers game. It comes down to votes. Um, uh, at the moment, I'm outnumbered, um, but I have some satisfaction in slowing down the rate at which things are getting worse. <laughs> um, set your goals low and then you can achieve them easily. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's wonderful and we'll talk again next week, taking another aspect of this. And I think this little series will inspire many Kiwis. So thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Logan Courtney. And particularly, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.